Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Pokies Burke, and this is the Career Slay Podcast. Imagine the impact we could have on society if everyone loved what they did. That's what Career Slay is all about. I'm interviewing people who love their jobs and asking them how they got there and what they've learned along the way. We're here to slay the fear in career. My next guest on Career Slay is Paula Schneider. Paula Schneider is the president and CEO of Susan G. Komen, responsible for the strategic direction and day-to-day operation of Komen's research, community health, public policy advocacy, and global programs. Schneider brings a personal perspective to Komen's mission as a breast cancer survivor whose mother died of metastatic breast cancer. Schneider is widely regarded as an expert in organization management and finance, serving as president and CEO of American Apparel and Delta Galil Premium Brands, and as president of Warnico Swimwear Group. She served in strategic advisory roles at the private equity firm, The Gores Group. A featured speaker at Fortune's Most Powerful Women's Summit in 2016, Schneider was also named one of Los Angeles Business Journal's 500 Most Influential People for 2016 and garnered the National Association of Women's Business Owners Inspiration Award in 2010. As Komen's president and CEO, Schneider is responsible for the world's largest breast cancer research portfolio, almost $1 billion in funding to date, and a network of more than 80 Komen affiliates serving millions of women and men in the United States and globally. I'm so excited to share this episode with you all. It is so good. But before we dive into it, I have to give you the inside scoop. So we launched Career Slay in October of 2022, and shortly after the launch, I got an email from Paula Schneider, the CEO of Susan G. Komen. She had heard about the podcast from her team, and she sent me a note extending her support from Susan G. Komen and thanked me for sharing my story. So naturally, I thanked her back and asked her to share her story. In this episode, we talk about Paula's entrepreneurial beginnings, how she crafted her own college major, started her own fashion company, and then went on to be the CEO of several other fashion companies. Paula shares how mentorship played a role in her career and how her own personal experience conquering breast cancer led to her most impactful job to date, leading Susan G. Komen. She's truly a legend, and I hope you enjoy every minute of this inspiring episode. Welcome to Career Slay, Paula. My pleasure. Let's start from the beginning. Tell us your story. What were you like as a child? <laughs> okay, that's a long time ago, but um, I was uh, was born in the San Francisco area, and I was... Uh, I thought I had a fantastic childhood. It was very, very middle class, um, but, um, you know, really loving parents and a great family. And, you know, I went from there to going to uh, Chico State, which was listed as one of the top party schools in the nation, which was literally why I went there. It had nothing to do with the (laughs) academics. It had nothing to do with learning. It had to do with, oh, my God, that sounds so much fun. And that's what I wanted to do. So that's where I went to college. I have a degree in costume design and theater, which was uh, a degree that I wrote myself because I wanted to do something that was really interesting to me. So they had allowed you to, in the California State University system to write your own um, major if you feel that there's something that they are missing. And it is now an accredited major in the in the state university system. But then I went back to school and got my teaching credential because I thought, you know, what if I can't make a living being in costume design? which I never really did. Um, but I taught school for one year. And then I decided that that was really fun. I really enjoyed it. It was teaching um, middle school. Mm-hmm. And um, I was 23 years old, but I made $785 clear a month and I couldn't live off oh, of it wow. even then. And I decided that I, I really wanted to do something that was going to be a little bit more uh, lucrative mm-hmm. for me. I worked as a, uh, in a retail store uh, for evenings and weekends while I was teaching Mm -hmm. to supplement my income. And then I started doing some buying for the retail store and going down to LA and, and, um, you know, I thought, wow, this is a whole world here that is really interesting to me. And I ended up um, moving down to LA and going into the apparel and the, and the retail and the fashion segment and did that for many, many years. So the interest in costume design, is that how you got into the fashion retail space? I could say yes, because it would be a natural progression, but it's probably not the truth. It was my interest in monetary gain that got me into the retail space because, um, you know, it was interesting to me as far as like, I I like the aesthetics of it and all of that, but it's, you know, it's a very major business. Um, And it it afforded a lot of opportunities that I didn't have growing up. 
And I thought, wow, this is really something that this is how people live. And, and uh, I worked for one year and then I started my own company. Tell me more. Yeah, that was a, it was a really sort of bold move. When you worked at the California Apparel Mart, there were certain floors that were really, really hot floors to have your, your showroom on. But they cost key money. And key money means that in order for you to pay a lease, it might be twenty or $30,000 for you to get the opportunity to lease that space for whatever it was a month. Mm-hmm. Because it was it, there was so much demand for it. And um, I remember I thought, you know, I want to start my own showroom and I'd like to do my own business. But, you know, I literally could borrow $5,000. And uh, that was from my mom. Oh, and really? there was no, you know, fallback plan. And I went to New York and I um, li- looked up all of the companies and, and apparel lines that didn't have representation in California. Went to them. I created a business plan. I um, pretended that I had a showroom on the third floor, which was the great floor. And I got all these people to give me their lines. And, you know, it was where as a manufacturer's rep. So you rep them and then they pay you commission on what you sell. Mm -hmm. Right. And so literally then I had no showroom and I thought, okay, I'm going to get one. And I because I had now people that gave me (laughs) their lines and I what comes first, the chicken or the egg? I didn't want to start a business and then not have anyone um, be able to give me their their, you know, clothing lines to rep. And so then I got a showroom on a crappy floor and um, I called everyone that was on the manufacturers the night before and said, listen, you guys are coming out tomorrow and I have a hundred appointments for market, but I'm moving to a new up and coming area in the, in the Mart that is on the second floor. And, you know, some were fine by it, some were upset by it, but I said, look, what do you have to lose? If, if, if you don't like it after you leave, then I won't continue repping your line. You can just take it with you and you take the orders and you just pay me on what I wrote. And so it turned out that I did really well over that market. Everyone kept their lines with me and, and that was the start of my business, but it was, you know, a sort of bold move, a a career slate. You did. You really slayed. How old were you again? 25. How did you have the confidence to do that? I don't know. You know, I look back at it now and um, I don't know. I I don't really know how I did that. But, you know, I wrote my own major in college. I've always been very entrepreneurial. And um, so it was, a you know, it was a a moment in time and it it was a good business. I sold the first dress of BCBG. Amazing. Wow. You know, and then we built that company and then I ended up going and selling my business and going and working for BCBG and, and became their president. And you know, worked there for like 13 years. And that gave me a really good uh, background to parlay it into my next set of jobs, which point I ran BCBG and then I ran Laundry by Shelly Siegel. Then I ran um, the largest swimwear company in the world, which was owned by Warnico. And it had every major swimwear brand all the way up to Speedo, everything from Walmart to Bergdorf. Wow. Going from, you know, you starting your business, selling your business, going into the corporate space, and then you climbing the ranks in the corporate space. Tell us a little bit more about that journey and like what role did mentorship play in that journey? Well, I think mentorship was really important. Um, There were sort of three parts to my journey. One was the very entrepreneurial first part when you think about um, like my, my time at BCBG. You know, it was a very, very entrepreneurial time, huge growth, fun, really fun because, you know, you're growing up in it and you're learning it and, you know, you're 26 years old and and having a, a great time traveling all over and opening stores. And it was really, really great. After I left BCBG, I got hired into Laundry by Shelly Siegel, which wasn't doing as well. And um, they wanted someone who could help to turn it around. I was the president there. And then so that was the turnaround portion of, of my business career. And that one has sort of stuck with me because I, I was, and, you know, stayed with, as a turnaround girl for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it has to do with the jobs that you're offered as a woman. A lot of times they are more difficult positions because women will take them versus men mm-hmm. and they don't always succeed, but there were mentors along the way. When I worked um, at, at BCBG, you know, I worked with Max Azria, who was the founder. And although I can't really say a mentor, he was visionary. I mean, he would go off and he had no fear 
literally no fear. And I learned that you can do a lot more when you have no fear. Wow. He got in fights with every major retailer, which allowed me to meet all the tops of all the retailers because I had to solve the problem with the fights. And then laundry was really great because um, Angela Arendt was my boss and she ended up, you know, she was the CEO of Burberry. And then she ended up as the head of all of retail at Apple. You know, she's a fantastic human being that I really enjoyed working with. And she, you know, I remember we went through the first P&L exercise because I really, I, I didn't have a background in finance mm -hmm. and I'm not a financial if you will, CEO. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, she would say, okay, to take me through the quarter and tell me what's happening. And I would take her through and, and you know, and this line and that line and this line. And then she'd look at me and she'd go, okay, well, what about this, 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 this? And then I'd go, hmm, okay, well, I'll find out, but I promise you next time I will know more. And, you know, and I learned because she allowed me to learn and she didn't do it in a way that was obtrusive. She did, she did it in a way that was mentoring and helpful. So I really enjoyed her leadership and also leading with humor because she was really funny. And funny is, is, it is much more pleasant to work with people that have a good sense of humor. Especially in turnaround situations, I would imagine. Yeah, that's, that's a little less fun <laughs> and a little less funny. Although, you know, the things that happen some places are are things that you can't really compare. And so, and then I went into um, private equity and worked there um, for a while. And it was interesting. I was kind of like a house guest that didn't go home because I was deciding what I wanted to do. That was a, a few years and, and a lot of learnings. And then I ran American Apparel, which was the biggest turnaround of all and part of, you know, cult culture, fascinating time. Uh, and it was, you know, I took us through a planned bankruptcy because th there was so much debt on the company that it couldn't survive. So all of that private equity, American apparel that happened after your breast cancer journey. Mm -hmm. Let's take a step back and tell us more about your breast cancer experience. Yeah, not fun. Um, never is, I'm sure, but mine was particularly not fun. Uh, I was, I remember I was in this massive turnaround at, at, Warnica Swimwear Group, which was, you know, Speedo and all the swimwear brands. And we were, we were converting from a, uh, a owned factory base to an outsourced factory base. And we had, you know, it was a, it was a huge restructure and I felt alone. You know, I thought, wow, this is not good because my mom had had breast cancer. So I went and got a mammogram and they told me that I had breast cancer. And I, you know, I remember asking the doctor the first time I said, I met him, I said, listen, can I have three weeks? because I'm in the middle of this massive restructure. Will I die if I have to take three weeks? Because I'm, I'm in a restructure. I just would like to finish this before I have to start chemo. And he said, yeah, you can do it, but don't wait any longer than that. He said, because you, you, know, you have a very aggressive form of breast cancer. I'm like, okay. I remember that Monday and Tuesday, we had significant layoffs, which are always horrible. Mm -hmm. Wednesday as, was when I told my team I had cancer. And then Thursday, I went into chemo. Oh so, you know, I, I will always count that as one of the worst weeks of my life. Were you still working while you were getting treatment? Yep. The only wow. thing I wanted to do was go back to work because it made me feel normal. Mm -hmm. So I'd go through chemo and it would knock me out for days and days and days. And then I'd go back to work and I, I worked on the second floor. There was an elevator. But if I could, I would make myself walk up those stairs wow. because I felt like even if it took me like 20 minutes to walk up one flight of stairs, literally. Um, but I thought, you know what, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to make myself go up the stairs. And, uh, you know, I went through uh, my treatment and everything while I was working. And it was, you know, not easy. There was a lot of time that I had to take off because it's tough. How did your cancer experience change the way you approach work? You know, the way that I got this job, I was, I was after, after um, American Apparel, I ran seven for all mankind for a very brief stint. And I thought, you know, I, I really have to do something that is more motivating for me because I give a rat's ass if I sell another pair of jeans to Bloomingdale's. I really don't. Although the jeans were nice and Bloomingdale's was nice. It wasn't my vocation anymore. I, I just and I got an award for being one of the top female retailers in the country from the Women in Retail Conference, which is a fun conference. It's in Miami. And so I got up on, on stage and I was supposed to give a speech about being empowered when I was the least physically powerful. And it was from the heart. And I, I was speaking about, you know, how when you're used to being large and in charge, whether you run a company 
or you have a family and then you can't do anything. You can barely make it to the bathroom by yourself. Um, you have to allow people to help you. And there's a certain amount of grace in that. And people come, from, you know, my, my support system was incredible. My friends were incredible. My husband was in, incredible. My family, my daughters, everyone, you know, that did everything that they could to help me. So I, I gave that speech and it was very heartfelt. And I sat down next to a really good friend of mine that I literally had breakfast with that morning where we were both talking about, God, we just want to do something that is more meaningful than what we're doing right now. So I sat down next to her after I got my speech and she said, listen, I, while you were up there speaking, I got an email from a friend of mine that's a recruiter and they're looking for a new CEO for Susan G. Komen. Would you ever be interested in that? And I said, hmm, yes, I would. And it didn't happen quickly. She's like, oh, my God, okay, I'm going to tell them I have found the one. <laughs> and um, so she sent out an email, and I didn't even have a, a job interview, and that was Thursday. Friday, my husband was actually in Miami with me. He said to me, you know, well, what do you think? Do you want to go for it? And I said, yeah, I, I, I want to go for it. And I said, but I have to quit my job. And he goes, well, you even have an interview. <laughs> and I go, yeah, but I'm, you know, it's public, so I can't do that. So Monday I gave notice and yeah, I didn't even have an interview and it didn't really even matter at that point because yeah. I just felt like I had to do something that was more meaningful than, than what I was doing. And so, you know, the, the interview process was long and arduous and they brought me to Texas three times in the summer who does that when they actually want you to take it down? I know. They should have just done Zoom. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was really, I, I felt like it was a calling. Yeah. I remember telling the board of directors in, in the nominating governance area that were interviewing me that, listen, I think I'd be really good at this, but if you find somebody that you think would be better, you, you really need to hire them because wow. this is so much more important than me to me than a, a career move. Right. This is this is really about saving lives and saving my daughters who are illustrative of everyone else's daughters. Amazing. Wow. And it seems very serendipitous that you got that call the day that you were giving that speech and it happened so quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if something happens like that, you, the universe is telling you something. You got to listen for sure. And I can't quit or retire until breast cancer is cured. So, you know, <laughs> I, I have work to do. Tell me, why is it so important to infuse purpose and passion into your career? You know, I, I the first day that I got the job and I hadn't been in the office yet, right? And I got, I uh, walked in and there's pink walls and that were in the office at the time. And one of the, right outside my office, it said, the work you do here saves lives. And I thought, you know, wow, it almost brought a tear to my eyes. I thought, well, this is so cool, but the onus and responsibility is so huge. Um, but I feel like every single day that I get up, I'm honored to be here and that I am I'm, I'm motivated to do this work. And, uh, you know, I just have to think about my girls and I have a, a daughter who's 29 and a daughter who's 26 and they're the loves of my life. And, you know, the, the thought of anything of them having to ever go through this is, is what motivates me every single day to work really hard to get this done. So. It's, you know, if you can find something uh, that you can do as a career, um, you're very lucky that if that motivates you this much, that's mission driven for you in some way, shape or form. But even if you can't do it as a career, because very few people can, you know, get involved, find something you care about. If it's breast cancer, you know, then go to Komen.org and, and see if they're, you know, and you want to volunteer, we have ways you can do that. But if it's not us, do something that's for the greater good. It'll make you happier and it'll do something that's good for the, the, the world. Yeah. I love the fact that, you know, your daughters are kind of the driving force for the reason why you do this work. I mean, I, I think, you know, my story, but I was um, pregnant while I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so I think about my daughter every single day when I'm I'm trying to, you know, leave a legacy and live my best life and do something that will make a change in the world. So thank you for that. That must have been so harrowing because all you think about is being able to be there for your children. Yeah. When I got diagnosed, my youngest daughter was going into junior high and my oldest daughter was going into high school. And, you know, those are very important milestones for them, especially to have their mom. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's it. I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones and because 
um, you know, I've made it through and I, you know, I'm, it's 15 years out and it doesn't mean forever, but it means for today. And a lot of our work is to, for women like you and I, that um, especially you, because you're so young, um, that will hope, hopefully never have a recurrence, right? Or never go into metastatic status. You know, breast cancer won't kill you. It's when it metastasizes that it will. Yeah. We do a lot of our work and a lot of our research is specifically on why things metastasize, how to keep them from metastasizing, how to keep people that are living with metastatic disease alive longer in a healthier way. So we have we have really moved a lot of our our research to that area because if we really care about you know about taking care of, of the people that are here and making a dent in in the number of people that die from breast cancer, that's what we have to do. Yeah, I remember um, my breast surgeon. She had only treated one other patient who had a similar case to mine, where she was pregnant, and she was kind of my guiding light. She made it through and um, was clear for two years. And then unfortunately it metastasized and it it came back. And so of course, you know, when you go through that experience and you see someone who is a role model to you go through that experience again, you can't help but think in the back of your mind, you know, what is my expiration date? Unfortunately, there are cases, you know, there are significant amount of cases that come back. It's not the majority. So, you know, you have to keep that in perspective and you have to be able to breathe. Um, you know, because no one knows what the future holds and find joy every single day in what you do. Exactly. So you had written an article that said this experience made you a a better CEO. Can you talk a little bit more about why? Yeah. You know, I can use a really funny example. Before I started working at American Apparel, um, I went to the office. It was Christmas Eve. It was the day of Christmas Eve. And I was going to start on January 5th. I'd already been hired, but I was bringing some folks in that I was showing them around to see, you know, if they wanted to come and join me there or whatever. And um, so I was taking them on a tour of the buildings and the buildings are huge. They were 850,000 feet, you know, it's like almost a million feet in just in downtown LA and seven floors of manufacturing. And you have, you know, thousands of people on in the building, thousands. And I see this the head of retail running as fast as she can towards me across this vast expanse of sewing floor. And I'm looking at her thinking, "Hmm, what wonder, wonder what's going on there. And so she comes up and she says, there's a fire. Okay. I said, where? And she pulls me around the corner and we can see smoke coming out of the elevator shaft. And by the way, everyone's still sewing. Mm -hmm. And, and there's literally smoke coming into the room to this big giant warehouse space. Right. I said, okay, so you take the bottom three floors and evacuate everyone from the building. And I will take the top four floors and evacuate everyone from the building. You know, and I'm thinking, I have no idea how to do this, but I'm super calm. And I grab this poor man's arm who walks by me and I said, hi, you don't know me, but I'm your new CEO. Do you speak English? And he says to me, yes, he's, it was a Hispanic gentleman. And I said to him, is fuego fire? And he says, yes. And I said, okay. And so I am now yelling, um, fuego and I, you know, and he's yelling, go to the exits. And there are all these little ladies are walking up to me and saying, do we take our, our purse or are we coming back to work? I don't know. I have no idea. And it turned out to be like a fire in just in that shaft, which turned out okay. But, you know, we got everybody out of the building safely. Oh, my gosh. Like, talk about putting out fires like that. We say that all the time (laughs) in corporate America. And you literally put out a fire. That's so that's an incredible story there. When I say that there could be fires all around me and I can remain calm. And, and I think it also, I think it has to do with the fact that, you know, if you feel like you're in a life or death situation for an extended period of time, you learn to live with that feeling. So going back to your role at Susan G. Komen today, um, what do you love most about your job? Well, there's so many things. Um, I think it's really the impact that we have as an organization. You know, many people, if you say Susan G. Komen, most everyone knows the name, right? And thinks about races and walks. And that's, you know, that certainly is a part of what we do. But that part of what we do is only to fund 
what we actually do, which is um, there's there's sort of three legs of the stool at Komen. One is cutting edge research. And we ha- we're 40 years old now. And over the la- last 40 years, Komen has had its fingerprints on every major breakthrough that has happened in research for women for breast cancer. We have uh, the advocacy arm and which is essentially helping to pass bills and laws that will help for women's health. And we have um, about 110,000 people that volunteer for our advocates uh, and our advocates for us for women's health. And there's a lot of power in women in pink with pitchforks because we really get things done, both at the state level and the federal level. And then the third part of it for us, the third leg of the stool is essentially meeting people where they are. If you get a breast cancer diagnosis or a friend of yours does or whatever, you can call our helpline. Um, we will help you through if we have, if you have financial burdens, we will help. Um, we'll help you to ask the questions that, you know, because who knows what you're supposed to ask your doctor? Yeah. Um, how do you find the best care? How do you get diagnostics done? All of those things, anything, any questions that you have, then we can help you with. And that's just our, our common helpline. Yeah. I think speaking from my experience, one of the crazy things that you experience when you get a diagnosis like that is there's all of this language that you're getting, you know, all <laughs> Yeah. New words. You know, I never went to medical school, have no idea no, what's going on. And so your resources were so helpful to me to explain what was happening to me, you know, and how do I navigate through that? You know, we work with Harvard on all of the information that goes into our about breast cancer and all of that. So we, you know, we're, we're a trust broker. You can trust what you read on our website. That's amazing. Looking back, what advice would you give your 20 year old self? I think is, is to find the joy every day. Um, because I think that is the most important thing and not get literally not let all the little fires bother you because, you know, if you, you day goes by and you haven't found the joy, then you miss that day and there's, there's no way you get it back. So, um, you know, everybody's going to have to work and everybody's going to toil and there's going to be good things that happen in your life and bad things that happen in your life. And you got to sort of en- enjoy for sure the calm between any storms because there will be storms. Um, but I think it's it's finding your own peace and happiness and you can only do that for yourself. I love that. So if you had to sum up your career in three words, what would that be? I would say entrepreneurial for sure wild because i have had a really interesting wild career with many ups and downs and and sideways and fulfilling that's amazing thank you paula for everything that you do i'm really humbled um, that you were able to come on to the podcast well and i'm glad you're healthy and well thank you uh, continue to stay that way and and you know it's the we work every day tirelessly for women like you, Kelly. So it's it's our goal to make sure that uh, everyone stays as healthy as they possibly can. Oh, wait, one more thing I want to say to anyone who's listening is if you haven't gone out and gotten your mammograms because of COVID or anything else, put your big girl panties on and get out there because yes. early detection will save your life. So please, it will help. Do it. Because you don't, you don't ever want to hear the words. And if you hear the words, you certainly want it to be an early stage. Yes, go. Please go. Well, thank you so much, Paula, for your time and for taking the time to speak with me today. We really enjoyed this conversation and for having you on Career Slay. And it's my pleasure. The Career Slay podcast is a co-production of Career Slay and Wild Reply, produced by Michael Burke. If you like the show, subscribe and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. New episodes drop every other Tuesday, so stay tuned for some great conversations on slaying the fear in career. <laughs>